privilege to have with us today our district overseer and his wife, Melody and Stephen Harris. Raise your hand. Ferris. All the way from Mill Cove. How many know where Mill Cove is? Uh, one, two hands, three hands. Uh, it, it's down that way somewhere. <laughs> uh, population? We don't know. You don't know. Counting the cows or not? Yeah. 40 with the cows, maybe? Okay, okay. And uh, I've known Steve for quite a while now. It's a pleasure to have him with us. He's uh, taken over the church at Mill Cove. He's bivocational. He works at other jobs also, full time, which makes uh, a little bit more uh, demanding, plus the church, and plus being district overseer. And uh, he has a real heart for God, real love for God. Ever since I've known him, he has that the joy of the Lord and the love for God. And we're just going to give him the word today. He's got a word for you. And uh, come on up, Steve Ferris. Thank you, sir. Good morning. It is an honor to finally be with you this morning. And it is so great to see so many familiar faces. How many people here have actually been to Mill Cove? It won't be a lot, but there, yeah, there's more than I thought. This is awesome. <laughs> This is awesome. So when I tell people I am from a small community, nobody really ever understands how small it is. You may think the Dalhousie Junction is a small community. There are almost streetcars and subways here compared to where we live. Um, the, you know, the, the catchment area of our, of our church is probably maybe seven or 800 souls within about a 20 minute, 15 to 20 minute drive. We are rural. We are along the shores of Grand Lake, which has the distinction of being the biggest freshwater lake in the province. We are partway, when I just tell people where we're from, it's between Fredericton and Moncton. And it's about an hour to Moncton, it's about 40 minutes to Fredericton, and if you go south from us, it's about 58 to 60 minutes to St. John. I bring you greetings this morning from our regional overseer in Quebec Maritimes, um, Brother Makali Morissette. And he said to bring greetings to you definitely when I told him where I would be today. Um, Melody and I, just to give you a tiny bit of background, because I came to talk about the one we just worshipped, not about us. Because how many enjoyed the presence of God in our worship this morning? It was awesome. And we have known Pastor Glenn and Pastor Mona for a long time. Um, one of the coolest things I ever we used to have a Bible school, and some of you actually went to some classes and went to some years when we had Mission to Canada in Mill Cove. And uh, one day I ran into Pastor Mona in the hallway, and she didn't know where the class had gone. And she came to me, and she said, oh, thank goodness I found you. And I said, okay, what's going on? She said, I thought the rapture had taken place, and I had been left behind because I can't find anybody in this big building. <laughs> she may not remember that, but I do. Um, my wife Melody and I, we have been going around together since 1986. She came back to the Lord. We were both backslidden when we met. Um, she came back to the Lord. Can you hear me? I, I maybe need a little more juice up here. It is, but um, I know he is too, by the way. And um, we came back, she came back to the Lord in 1998. We were married in 1991, and it was 1995 when I came back to the Lord. I was backslidden. I was in the world, I was of the world, I was by the world, and I was for the world. But thank God for his mercy that drew me home before it was eternally too late. So if you're here this morning and you're on the fence, when I came back to church, I was on the fence for three months. And God chose miraculously to give me a second chance in my Christian life. And I'm forever grateful. I never intended to pastor the church in Mill Cove. In fact, I grew up with not a great opinion of Pentecostals. I was raised in another church, that, and I didn't have a great opinion of that church. And my wife very gently kept inviting me. I very gently kept saying no, but God had a plan. Um, we experienced, after I came to the Lord in 95, we experienced the call to ministry in 1998. It took five years for us to step into that ministry. We were waiting for the Church of God. Our 65-year-old independent church became a Church of God in 2003, and God just began to open doors. In 2005... Um, I was received my first credentials with Church of God in 2008. I was ordained with the Church of God. And in that same year, 
well, 2007, technically, we became the pastors of that church. So we've been pastoring a Church of God church in Milko for 14 years. God has chosen to allow us to serve in this capacity as your district overseer since 2015. So I apologize. It took so long to come to such a beautiful place as you have here. This is absolutely gorgeous. It's like going home. The people say, well, this is a beautiful place. You haven't been here in the winter. But, and I'm sure it's the same for you. I am bivocational. I am a letter carrier at Canada Post in Fredericton. I walk door to door, and in a year, if you added my steps together, I could walk to Cleveland, Tennessee, and back in a year. If I went one way, I could walk to Medicine Hat, Alberta in a year. About 18 kilometers a day we walk in this job. So when I saw Sugarloaf up here, I thought, oh boy, I'd like to try that. <laughs> it's gorgeous. But we came this morning on business for the king. Amen? So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. And I am, as you turn there, I want to tell you how beautiful this sanctuary, this edifice, this place that, that has been built to bring glory to God is, and what a wonderful job you have done. And I don't know how you guys made out through COVID, but I have a pretty good idea from talking to your pastors last night at dinner that it was rough. And I am so glad you stuck with it. And for those that are online, when you feel your time is right, come back and get with it. Amen? Amen. And I, I just love you all, and I'm so glad that we are pulling together, that we serve together. We have seven Church of Gods in the Maritimes, and I am glad that we together are two of them. Amen this morning. So if you have your Bibles, Hebrews 14, beginning at verse 14, says this. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For do we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted, as we are, yet without sin? Let us, therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace, that we, have made, we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of of need. How many here have ever had a time of need where you needed mercy and you needed grace? And if that is you today, today is your day because God is here. How many experienced God as we worshiped him this morning? Amen. I could hardly, I couldn't have sat. I could hardly stand. I didn't know which way to go. But he's here this morning and he wants to help you. Amen. Do you believe that this morning? I told her I wouldn't ask her to speak because she doesn't like to speak, but she's an excellent preacher. But I'm going to ask my wife to pray and ask God to help us this morning. Dear Lord, we just thank you for your presence here this morning. And it doesn't matter how far away we go, Lord, oh God, you're, you're with us. Yes. And I just pray, oh God, that you be with these people this morning, Lord, to open their hearts to receive your word and be with Stephen as he brings it forth in your name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and when I see you afterward at the barbecue, I will be Steve, okay? <laughs> Wasn't my idea. Mom called me that. And it's okay if you call me that, too. But this morning, I came to ask you a question. What or who do you have your confidence in? Now, we are confident in many things. When we are, and we love the place that you accommodated us for last night, a beautiful hotel. But I was very confident when I got up this morning that when I jumped out of bed, my feet were going to hit the floor. I don't know if you've ever stayed anywhere where you were concerned about that. One time, my, my friends and I, when we were little, we built a little tiny shacky cabin. I don't know how many people here ever had the little camp in the woods or the tree house or whatever it was if you didn't you missed it this place was a hovel it had the dirt floor of the forest and it was built in the woods and when you jumped out of bed you had to remember you were this far from the ceiling and it was about a four and a half foot drop to the floor and I almost forgot one morning but I was confident this morning that floor would be there in the hotel and when I went into the shower and I turned the tap on and I turned it up I was confident that there was going to be water I was really excited that it was hot water, and that is good too. I grew up on a farm, and our water was heated by the wood stove that was in the kitchen. It was a primitive farm. My family has lived in New Brunswick, actually, before it even was New Brunswick. The year before it was New Brunswick, my family moved here from New York City. We had to get out of New York City because we were no longer invited. George Washington and his army were marching down through Manhattan, and we had to get out of town. And I wasn't there, but obviously through history of my family, I found this out. 
And we didn't always know if there was going to be hot water because we didn't know if the stove had been on long enough to heat the water. How many grew up when there was a place where the water was heated this way? Oh, my word. <laughs> okay, I'm home among my people. When you, <laughs> when you get in your car this morning, were you confident when you put the key in it? Or now you don't even have to put the key in it. You just have to have your key in your pocket that the car would start. If you said yes to any of these things, the reason is simple. You have learned to put your confidence in these things. You know that these things of our technology are going to work. It took a lot of te technology this morning to bring worship. The drums are electronic, the, 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 the keyboard is electronic, the mics, the iPads, everything is back there. I was hoping it would all work, believing it would all work. You learn to put confidence in these things. But do you have confidence this morning in the Lord Jesus? Today we're going to learn to how we can have confidence when we pray. And when we talk to the Lord Jesus, and we want confidence from him about what to do in life. How many know that there are places you are in life you have to make decisions? You have to come to decision points. You have to come to breaking points. And I've come to many of them. The word of the Lord declares in James 1 and 5, If any of you lack wisdom, if you don't know what to do, let him ask of God, who gives all liberality and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask how? You have to ask in a certain way. You have to ask in faith, with no doubting. I didn't doubt the floor would be there. I didn't doubt the hot water would be here. I didn't doubt the car would bring me here. So why should I doubt him? Why should I? I know there's reasons why, and we'll talk about that, that we may get into doubt. But it says not to ask with, it says with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. For he is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. To pray with confidence, we need to focus on the Lord and not on the problem. How many of us find in our lives that most of the time we are mountain climbers? We trudge along through the, the things of life. We trudge, we put up with it. We just get along, we get with it. When really, we are more than mountain climbers. In Christ, did you know that we can be mountain movers? How many know the word of the Lord declares, if you speak to that mountain, say, be tossed into the sea. Amen. How many, I, I, that mountain, that, that sugar law, a thousand feet high. If that thing ended up in the bay, I don't know what it would do to the cottage on the waterfront, but I got a pretty good idea there'd be a tsunami. But can you imagine the tsunami if we truly put our confidence and faith in God, what we could see in our lives, instead of getting along and putting up with what we put up with. We need to focus on him. You notice when you're driving, I don't know if you were ever taught this or not, but you tend to drive where you look. Most of the time, I'm the driver. And Melody can tell when I'm, uh, do you use the term gawking here? Then who knows what gawking is? <laughs> if the driver does any gawking, there can be trouble. You can drift over one line, or drift over the other line. How many here have ever heard the expression, for one mile of road, there's two miles of ditch? <laughs> you can end up in some of those ditches if you don't watch yourself. But where you look is where you go. In prayer, do we focus on what we are looking for? Or do we focus on who we are looking to? I was taught a long time ago when I pray, not to seek the hand of God. How many know the hand is the way that we get things? When God does this and does that, his hands give it to us. I was taught not to seek just his hands. Those nail-scarred hands. I was taught to seek his face. Amen? The first thing you do when you pray is you look to him. You look for God. You say, God, I'm here to talk to you. You know, a lot of times, how many know when you went to your parents and you needed 20 bucks to go out on Friday night? All you wanted to see was the purse or the wallet. That's all you really needed. Everything else, you didn't go and say, Mom, Dad, I love you, unless you were buttering them up. How many here ever had to butter up? <laughs> this expression you use here? Well, anyway, you, we, we got to remember that we're talking to the name above all names, the one that's worthy to be praised, amen? And we need to look to the Lord and not to the problem. It's how Paul could say, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you. 1 Thessalonians. Oh, where's the reference? I turned it over too quick. <laughs> 5 and 18. Here's the problem. 
much of our prayer is somewhat useless because we are totally focused on the problem and not the fact that God is the solution. How many times have you ever really gotten in a mess and you just talk to God briefly? How many have ever had those quickie prayers? Now, your pastors will encourage you not to make your prayer life around quickie prayers, like those really fast ones that you just breathe. Every now and then going to work, I'm a relief carrier, meaning I fill in for other people's vacations and absences. Some weeks when I go to work, I have no clue what part of the city I'm going to. I have no clue what streets I'll be delivering. Could be the roughest part of town. Could be the hoity-doity part of town where all the money is. I have no clue. And almost when I get to work, after praying for the other things I prayed in my 40-minute drive to work, because we are in the middle of nowhere from where we live, I say, oh, God, give me a good route. And it amazes me how many times he actually does that. I'll get this sweet route that I shouldn't have gotten because my seniority isn't that high because I haven't worked there so long. How many have ever worked in a unionized environment and know what I'm talking about when I say seniority? If your seniority is low, you get what you got. Amen? And not a whole lot more. But I'll tell you what. We need to focus on the fact that God is the solution. Here's a little tiny case study for sake of time. I have, is that clock right? Back there? What time are we barbecuing? Oh, come on now. Come on now. Is it okay if I'm just me today? If I visit the same as I do when we were in our own church, is that okay? I, I love being at home among the people of God. And I find everywhere I go, people are people. Amen? It doesn't matter how big your bank account is. It doesn't matter how small it is. It doesn't matter whether you have four cars or no car. God is still God. God loves you. And it's great to be with his people. This morning, I want you to think for a bit back to when you were maybe in Sunday school. I don't know how many here went. I went to Sunday school when I was little. I had a drug problem when I was young. I had another one later, but I had a drug problem. My mom drugged me to Sunday school. My mom drugged me to church. My mom, mom made sure she drugged me to the car and put me in it when I was going to youth group in a little place called Jim Sag, which is down the road from us. She drugged me as many years as I could be drugged when I got about that high, because I never did get very high. I was always built too close to the road, but when I got about that high, I said, I'm not going anymore, and I didn't for 15 years. But in all that time, I remember the great stories that my Sunday school teachers would tell me. And I want to tell you this morning, all, almost all the great influences in my life as a child were women. My, our superintendent was a great lady of God. She loved God. She was strict. We grew up in a little church. The oil stove was sitting in the back of the church, and the chimney went up through and out the roof right inside the sanctuary. That little tiny church, just for an aside to tell you, it's amazing what a small beginning can do. That church was opened in about 1809 in our little community on a side road. And that little church was a Baptist church. And that church was so burdened for the fact that there was no Baptist churches in the city of Fredericton that five or six families picked up and moved to Fredericton and started a Baptist church downtown in Fredericton out of the little community that I'm from. That church nowadays has about seven or eight regular attenders that still go there. But the church they planted in Fredericton on Brunswick Street, Brunswick Street Baptist Church, is a church with about six or eight million dollars worth of property downtown, a congregation of over 500 people, and it was planted out of that little tiny church that I went to that had the chimney. It was a wood stove way back and then an oil stove later. Isn't it amazing what God can do from a little place to affect a big place? Amen? How many know the the work that you do here, the giving you do in missions, you don't see it because you're here. You don't see the effect it is when you release Mona to go and do what she does around our nation and around and through into the United States. You don't see it, but God sees it, and God will bless you for what you do when you sacrificially give. But I want to get back to my story here eventually. (laughs) The problem that they had, there was a time in Israel when the rank and file army, and this is going back to that Sunday school story I learned so long ago, were totally intimidated and totally terrified of a man named Goliath. Why? Because he was a big old boy. He was large and he was in charge. And he terrified them. He was the champion of the Philistines. And their problem was they were totally focused on the giant. 
They forgot. How many know we forget sometimes? You forget who you are. How many know that you were redeemed? If you are here this morning and are redeemed. You're born again. You're a child of the Most High God. You were redeemed with a price that you couldn't pay by someone that you couldn't even afford to talk to. And he loved you so much. His Father loved us so much that he gave us his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world that the world may be condemned through him, but through him the world might be saved. Amen? Amen. But they focused that day and those days when they went to battle on the giant and not their God. How many here focus sometimes on the giants in your life? How many got a giant? Could be the giant in your health. Could be a giant in your finances. I don't know if this church is like any other church, but there might be somebody here you're not speaking to this morning, and you're both here this morning. It might not happen here. It happens at the church I pastor. Listen, giants. Here's the problem with giants is they're big. And God is, you know, everywhere present and nowhere absent. But the giant is right here. That boy was big. But then David comes to bring some lunches, some vittles, some food to his brothers. Because they are at war. Because he's young and he's back home. And he looks at the situation. And he gets that feeling in his heart. Is there not a cause? Isn't there something we can do about this? So Saul heard his challenge that he was ready to roll. And he wanted David, if David wanted to go face this guy, go ahead. But you better wear some armor. This guy is big. You better be prepared. His, his you know, sword and his brother's swords were the size of a weaver's loom. The, you know, the thing that they run through. Huge, big guys. David said, no, I haven't tried that armor. I, you know, I haven't tried it. I haven't proved it. But he had proved that God was God. How many know we try to use everything we can to tackle our problems and forget God until we get so far down the line that we can't do anything but turn to God? Ouch. I, the reason I know that we do this is because I do it. Amen? I'm just the same as you. You know, you tackle it this way, you tackle it that way, you use philosophy, you use psychology, you use trying to, you know, twist and, and make things happen your way, and all of a sudden it doesn't work, and you go, oh, God, prayer request. Prayer request, Lord. God! Help! And you get right in there. And then all of a sudden, God moves and God goes, here the whole time. Where you been? Right here. Sorry, Lord. Read this passage of scripture to you. It says, David said to the Philistine, to, jo to Goliath, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, you need to say to your giant, this day, this day, we all going to get a hold of you. Amen? Amen. We're going to get on it. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I will come and strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcass to the camp of the Philistines, to the birds of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. They're going to know after today. How do they know? Well, you and I still know today because we're still reading it today. Amen? That there is a God in Israel. Verse 47. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with the sword and the spear. Get, grab this. For the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into our hands. What do we forget? We forget that the battle is, we think the battle is ours. And you're going to take a little bit of God once in a while and dab it on like putting a cherry on top of a Sunday. How many remember when Sundays had cherries? I don't know if the Dairy Queen will still do that for you or not. We never asked last night. I guess neither one of us got a Sunday. <laughs> yeah, we went out for dessert late last night. I confess it. I believe it. We went for a drive last night. We had a beautiful supper. <laughs> and I still was thinking about something. I got a salad. That's the problem when you get a salad. Later on, you want to eat. But we think that we just need... <laughs> You laugh because you know. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, 
You know, you know, you know. Oh, just about dark. I, I didn't get a cherry on it. But that's the way we use God. We want just enough God. Just enough mercy. Just enough of him to get by. How many know that the Bible speaks about having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof? I tell you what, I was glad late last night we went to the Dairy Queen. Because I could have been anywhere late last night, even as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many know there's a lot of ministers that aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing on Saturday night and then coming and standing in the pulpit and telling people what to do on Sunday morning? I know where yours was last night. I'll tell you what. We can't be double-minded. Amen? It's Jesus or nothing. Amen? Amen? I tell you what, he is waiting for a people that are going to be... This is an old expression. You may have never heard this before. If you have, raise your hand. He's looking for people that are sold out. Amen? When you're sold out, how many remember Elisha when he sold out? He killed the oxen team that he was using to make his living with. He burnt the plow. I don't know where you come from. My plows were all metal, but I know the plow that he was using was a wooden plow. Amen? I've seen those plows. I never plowed behind a horse. I've done a ton of plowing on a tractor with, with you know, plows behind me, and then later it was a cab tractor, which was rather lovely. You could put tunes on my little son when he was little. He didn't sit beside me a lot. He sat beside my dad because him and my dad were like this. My little boy is 28 now. Pray for him. Amen? He needs the Lord. But I'll tell you what. David took five stones from that brook to go face the giant. And I've heard a number of different reasons why he took five. You know, the other ones were for the Goliath's brothers and all these different things. But listen, he only needed one because his faith was so strong in God that he couldn't miss. How many know we need to pray like we can't miss? Amen? We can't miss. Examples of proper focus. Just a quick one this morning. Do you remember blind Bartimaeus? Mark chapter 10, one of my favorite Bible stories of all time. Bartimaeus was blind from his birth. The faith of the prayer that Bartimaeus had when Jesus was walking by, Jesus had come into and was going out of Jericho. It, I won't get into that one really, really deep this morning for sake of time. But what did Bartimaeus pray to the Lord? And it was one of those quickie prayers. He didn't have time to get wound up. How many know sometimes we feel we need to get wound up to pray? O oh Lord God, omniscient, almighty, who have been around forever and ever. And you talk about, who, and it's great to exalt God for who he is. But I'll tell you what, Bartimaeus' moment was about that long. Jesus and the disciples and the entourage following him were passing by. He had a shot. And he didn't yell over to Jesus, hey, Jesus, I'm really glad I can't see. Here I am sitting blind. I can beg. I get a little living out of it. No. He didn't talk to Jesus about his problem. He talked to Jesus about the solution. He said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Call for mercy. Bartimaeus wasn't focused on his blindness. He focused on Jesus. Isn't it amazing that a blind person had better focus on Jesus than some of us who are sighted? Number two, to pray with confidence, we need to realize that Jesus opened the front door for us. A lot of people think, well, because of this in my life and because of that in my life and because of the other things in my life, I can't pray. You need to deal with those things. But the Lord left the front door open for you. How many that realize that, that we may boldly come to the Lord for any need? We don't have any boldness. When we have boldness, we come to the Lord not just for this need or that need or what's boiled over and running on top of us, but we come to him for all of our needs. When you realize the front door, how many here... Growing up, now I know not everybody was in the same situation. My wife grew up, life was rough where she grew up. Not the same as what I grew up in. Compared to the life that she grew up with, I grew up with the Waltons, without the, all the brothers and sisters. I had the cousins instead. How many remember the Waltons, an old TV show? They all sat around the table and the other had grace and, you know, everybody loved everybody most of the time, by the end of the show at least. They all loved each other. But how many know that when you went back home, your parents would still let you go in the fridge? How many were allowed to do that? After you moved out, you were allowed to go home and you could still go in the fridge or in the cabinets and get whatever food you wanted. I was like that. Maybe you guys are different than we are down home. I was still, my, our son, when he goes to the house, he sees what kind of cheese we have, what kind of crackers we have, and what's in the pantry. Just comes in, 
Do you know that we can still have that? We can have that same kind of boldness to come into the presence of God. That we can come to him. When Jesus cried, it is finished. Something amazing happened in the temple. How many that know that he died on Mount Calvary? And the city of Jerusalem is built on mountaintops. On Calvary, he was taken. His life was taken from him. But over in the temple, something else miraculous was happening. A curtain was there, 20 cubits wide, 20 cubits high. What's a cubit? It's this. And this isn't a bad gesture, by the way, either. I'm not making an obscene gesture in church. <laughs> but it's the distance from your elbow to the end of your middle finger. It's about 18 inches average. 18 inches times 20 is 360 inches divided by 12 because we're in the metric system nowadays and some of you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. It's about 30 feet. 30 foot tall curtain. What's that mean? That's the same distance you have to be away from a building to vape. You ever seen those signs? Nine meters? That's about that distance. That curtain in the temple was rent. In other words, it was torn. What did that curtain represent? It represented the fact that nobody but the high priest, could, and, and this is a whole different sermon, could come into the presence of God, but once a year, on one day, to make atonement for all the nation of Israel. And you know what they did according to history? They tied a rope around his ankle as he went through the curtain to make the sacrifice in case he wasn't legally and purified properly and correctly if he had something that was in his heart that wasn't confessed before God because he was entering into the very presence of God. What would that do to your prayer life? Oh, if you had to make sure you were not just 99 and 44 100s, you have to be old because that's how they used to advertise ivory soap, that it was 99 and 44% pure. No, you had to be 100% pure. That guy, and they tied the rope in case they heard him fall over in there. They weren't allowed in there because only the high priest was allowed in there. And if he was unclean, they could drag him out with the rope around his ankle because he'd be dead. But what happened when Jesus said, it is finished? What was finished? The sacrifice that was needed, the holy and legal sacrifice that God needed to atone for sins, not just the sins of us today or the people in that day, but all the sins that had been atoned for with the blood sacrifices of the Old Testament, that was the real day of atonement, was the day that Jesus died on the cross. It was done. And the reason the curtain was torn was to signify the fact that no longer could just one person go in and make atonement for you because one person had already gone in and made atonement for you. His name was Jesus. He did it that day, and he did it for everybody before the cross and after the cross. I know we think linearly, li linear fashion, like over a time period. He, what he did that day was good for all all those blood sacrifices, the best description, and this might not be accurate, but I told Pastor Mona, if I say anything wrong up here that she doesn't agree with, or Pastor Glenn, they can fix it. They got weeks to fix it. Because <laughs> I'm only here once. <laughs> but it was paid. Paid in full. Amen? Amen? All the time before, all at that time, and all the time after. Your high priest has already again gone into the holy place. Because how many know the temple was just a representation of the things in heaven? He went in once. The blood sacrifice was accepted by God. And because it was accepted by God, the temple curtain was rent. I don't know whether it was fixed or not. I haven't read about that in history. Maybe it was. But it wasn't needed anymore. Because we all could come into the presence of God. Because the curtain was rent and we were allowed to enter into the presence of God. But how many of us, how many of us, I think of Melody's nephew when I think of this. Melody's nephew, now, like I say, Melody's upbringing was a little bit different. I'm not going to delve into that this morning. But her nephew was always wanted, he grew up, his grandfather was, he played a huge part. Melody's grandfather was a wonderful man. He had a rough beginning, but he ended well. How many know some of us have had a rough beginning, but we need to end well? He, he, was, he was a man of the woods. He was a man of the forest, of machines, of working with horses in the woods. He, he, took, he, he had some injuries that which led him to alcohol, but I never ever knew him to be a drunk because the year before I met him, 
he had given up the bottle. God had given him the grace to give up the bottle, even though he hadn't given his heart to the Lord. That happened later. But Jed was always afraid. We called him, his name was Jeremy. We called him Jed. He was afraid to ask his grandfather for anything verbally. So he'd write Gramps a note. He'd write Gramps a note. Gramps always sat at one end of the table in the kitchen at the farmhouse in Albert County, down by, you know where the rocks are on your Medicare card? Melody grew up just a few miles from those rocks down below Moncton. Well, anyway, he would write a note because he would toe kick and he'd, he'd worry for hours about whether he should ask Gramps for this or not. Knowing full well that Gramps would give him almost everything he wanted anyway. Listen, that's the way that some of us are with our God, with our Father. We're so concerned because of who he is. And we should be. We should, he is a holy God. We should reverence him. We should respect him. We should love him. But we should know that Jesus made a way for us to come to him. Amen? Amen. There's a big difference between reverencing somebody and not having a relationship with them. Amen? Amen. I've worked in my work life. I, 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 I was a farmer until I was almost 38. And I worked in construction for 12 or 14 years afterward. One of the jobs that we got to do in construction was to renovate old houses. And I love renovating old houses. We're doing one now. Melody looks at me like, I don't really believe that because it's taken us eight years and we're still not removed into our old house. <laughs> we live in the parsonage in Mill Cove, but we are working on our retirement home at the same time. And it is a 140, 150-year-old house. But one of the jobs we got to do was to work for the Irving family, not, just, not the Irving companies. I don't know what you think of Irving, and it doesn't really matter for our setting this morning. But I got to work for a sweet lady that was 80 years old who had popcorn white hair, who was driven around, get this, in a 20-year-old car by a, a, a young lady that was helping her with her housework. Her name was Jean Irving, and her husband was Jim Irving. How many have ever heard of this Irving family? They have their names on a lot of stuff in this province. I didn't know them. I never worked for the Irving companies, but we worked for her, and we renovated her childhood home. And whenever she'd come to visit, I got the Waterboro boy feeling around her when she was there. How many have ever been around people? I know some people, they get around the most, there's a famous person in the room, they're just like bugs to a light. Brrr, I gotta go talk to that person. I gotta go talk to the important person. Then there's people like me, kind of hang back and, you know, they're really important. What would they want to talk to me about? I was like that when Mrs. Irving would come to the house. And every once in a while, she'd say hi to me. I'd say, hi ma'am, how are you today? And that was all because I knew who she was. But she didn't care about any of that. It was childhood memories. It was going down memory lane. She grew up was born in this house that we renovated in Petticoat She didn't care. When they told her that I was a minister of the gospel, she was really excited because she's a very strong Wesleyan woman, right? Loves the Lord. Has done tons of work. If you drive through Sussex, there's a big chapel set on a hill. It's called the Saunders Irving Chapel. Saunders first because that's her maiden name. And she donated all the funds to build that for Kingswood University, which is the Wesleyan Bible School in New Brunswick. But I was scared to talk to her. How many of you know that we're like that sometimes with God? He is so holy and so high. And we think our problems are so menial and so low. Then what could I have to say to him? And we toe kick around the gate. And we stay outside of the gate when he's already opened the door for us to come in. You, you know, you feel unworthy for a number of things, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Yes, we in ourselves are unworthy, but the transforming blood of Jesus Christ over your life makes you worthy. So go in and get what you need. Amen? Amen. Tell the Lord. Say, God, this is my need. I don't understand or really know the best way to handle this, but I trust you. And if you trust him, you'll see great things. And lastly, to pray with confidence. We need to know that praying in confidence is God's will for our lives. Every now and then, a piece of scripture and a prayer becomes famous. And I don't know what you think about the guy that wrote the, the book, The Prayer of Jabez. I'm not talking about that book. I'm talking about that prayer. Amen? Now and then, it becomes famous. And it's simple, what he asked. You remember it. And I thought it was a series of verses. When you think about it, it was one verse. How many ever read Chronicles? When you're reading your Bible through in a year, your Bible in two years, your Old Testament, you get to Chronicles and you start going. <laughs> oh, okay. What's that say again now? Oh, okay. Yeah. But all of a sudden, interspersed, and in, in, there's great stories of, of great victories in the Kings and the Chronicles. But all of a sudden, interspersed, just that little piece, that one verse, and you know it. 
You probably remember it from maybe when it was famous. It says this, Jabez called on the name of the God of Israel saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me and you would keep me from evil that I may not cause pain. What did God do? He granted him his request. Wow. Sounds super greedy, doesn't it? What he was asking. He was asking a lot. But think about what he was asking. What did Jab Jabez got to the point with God that he realized something? that you and I need to realize today. God, I need your abundant blessing in my life. How many need the blessing of God on your life? You just don't need it on Sunday morning. You need it Sunday afternoon. You need it Tuesday morning. You need it Friday afternoon, and you sure need it Saturday night. How many know that God is needed? We just don't need him to meet our temporal means, or in other words, the needs of this life. But we need him to meet our spiritual needs as well. We seek him first in his righteousness. What's the word of God say? All these things will be added. Oh, but we, we like to start at the all these things will be added to you. I'd like to have all these things. I'd like to have this. I'd like to have that. I'd like to have the other thing. But what's the word of God say? Seek you first. That's right. I heard it over here. Number two, what did Jabez realize? God, I need you to increase my influence. That sounds kind of arrogant, doesn't it? To want to increase your influence. How many know as a child of God, your call is to influence? Amen? It's not to hide in the corner. It's not to toe kick the dirt around the front of the gate. It's not to stay out of the presence of God. It's to move into the presence of God. And then after you move into the presence of God, to move out into the world and talk about God. Amen? It's what we are called to do. Lord, make me a world changer. Some people think they never did anything to change the world. Did you know somebody? Somebody... And I read in the book, and I can't remember the guy's name. I should have put it in my notes. Somebody preached the gospel to Billy Graham. Whoever that cat was changed the world. How many know Andrew went and told his brother Peter? I found him. We got the guy. This is the one I think is the Messiah. You don't read a whole lot about the exploits of Andrew, but you sure do about Peter. You may only reach a few souls as influencers, sowing the good seed of love and of the word of God and of faith and of hope to a few souls. But you may reach one that reaches a million. You may reach one that reaches a hundred. You may reach one that reaches ten. I didn't start this thing. What I'm sharing isn't first generation. Pastor Glenn and Mona have been sharing it here, sowing seed. Some of the seed is out in the community now. It doesn't, hasn't, hasn't shown all of its growth yet. But as a farmer, I, I grew up as a farmer, farm kid. Let me tell you something about seed. There's a weed, and I know it's real because I pulled enough of it in my life. It's garden mustard. It's not the mustard the French is making to the delicious condiment that may be going on some of those things. I've been watching through the window and getting, getting hungry while I'm talking to you up here. No, it's, it's just mustard. It's gross, it's prickly, it grows in around your cabbage especially, around other things. It's hard to pull, it tears the skin off your hands when you're pulling it. If you do it on a wet day, it just makes you itch like crazy. But how many remember the Bible talks about having the faith as of a mustard seed? Let me tell you about sowing into the kingdom. That mustard seed, if it gets taken down, say you plow deep one year and you plow down below eight inches, and that seed gets flopped over into the bottom underneath, say, nine inches of soil. You went a little deep, because plow depth, when I was growing up, was about eight inches deep. For those of you who don't know what that is, that's 20 centimeters. That seed can lay there just below the level that it's brought up every year as you get your land prepared for your crops. It can lay there for as long. It can be, the word is viable. It can be viable for 50 years. How many know people that heard the gospel when they were young? And they didn't do anything with it, or they had a start at the parable of the sower, and then they kind of walked away and did the, but all of a sudden, late in life, that seed that's been there all those years, it starts to bubble up toward the top. It's brought up. That farmer goes into that field, and he plows a little bit too deep that year, he'll get a crop of mustard he didn't even know he had. I've heard farmers say the birds must have brought it in. No, it was brought up by your plow, because you went a little bit deep that year. 
How many know that we need to sow something? There'll never be a crop unless we sow. Ever. Why are we still talking about Jesus 2,000 plus years later? Because somebody told somebody who told somebody. Not just in this setting. Some of the greatest influences I've had in my Christian life were the people talked about him outside of the church. At the garage, at the house, at the gate, at the fence, on the farm. Amen? Number three, Lord, help to keep me holy. How many need God's help to keep you holy? Besides me. <laughs> when I do this, it's not for illustration purposes only. It's because I need help. Amen? Oh, district pastor. Oh, it doesn't make a bit of difference. Amen? I went to church one time. One of the greatest mentors I ever had. And you, Some of you know Pastor Phil Sigelko. They moved here from Moose Jaw, set up the school that we had. You know, like... One time I went to church and I said, did you hear there was a certain great leader in the United States that has fallen? And, and I, I don't know what happened to him. I said, have you ever heard of him? Pastor Phil said, yeah, give me his name again. He told me his name. He said, what do you mean he fell? He said, he's the president of the National Association of Evangelicals. Well, he might have been. He had a church of 12,000 people. Might have been. But he also had a coke habit, a boyfriend, in an apartment on the side to go along with his wife and children. And when he was found out of how his life really was, he had to leave. Pastor Phil says, I've sat at prayer breakfasts in big places in the United States across tables and this guy, you'd never know there's anything wrong. Amen? How many of you need God's help to keep us holy? It doesn't matter what your position is here, whether you're visiting for the first time today, or whether this has been your church since you can't remember. We need God's help. We cannot do this on our own. Amen. You know what you need to pray? Real slick, real simple. Lord, make me more like you. I'm old enough to remember a TV show called The Beverly Hillbillies. Now, it had a lot of bad social references that we don't do today. But one of my favorite parts was time that Jed, Uncle Jed, Cousin Jed, whittled a statue of granny. I have the strangest illustrations you ever saw. <laughs> Mona's thinking, oh, thank goodness he's almost done. <laughs> Love you, Pastor. Somebody come up to Jed and said, Jed, how did you get it to look so much like granny? He said, real simple, I just took away all the parts of the wood that didn't look like her. <laughs> Do you get it? God, take away... <laughs> <laughs> Take away all the parts, Lord, <laughs> that don't look like you. Amen. 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 I hope he doesn't really look like this. <laughs> but in my spirit, I want him to take away all the parts that don't look like him. Amen. Lastly, Lord, keep me from worry, pain, and anger. How many wake up at night and can't get back to sleep? You get on the train, I call it. The problems of the life you're in and the things that are going on, maybe you get it in the daytime. Good for you. If you can sleep all night... I wake up 4 o'clock in the morning. I think about people in the community that need God. I think about work. I think about my wife because she has poor health. I think about our son needs the Lord. Come back to God. I think about the people in the community that have been in the church and are gone from the church. Our church is over 80 years old. Pentecostal from the beginning. Chased out of towns. Stuff thrown on the roof of the tent. They try to get rid of it. It's the way our church started back in the day, 1938. I think about all of these things and I can't get back to sleep. How many know we need to give our baggage to God? Give it to God. Give it to him. Lord, take my spiritual baggage and cleanse my heart and mind. How many need that this morning? How many need that this morning? How many know that doing isn't always getting everything done? Sometimes you need to take it out of your inbox and put it into his. Amen? In fact, most of the time. And I do want the worship team to come back at some point because I'm closing. Sometimes there are reasons that we do not boldly go to our God. Why? Why would we not do this? We just talked about all the reasons we should be doing this. But sometimes it's because there's something in our life that we're not real proud of. I realize I'm in northern New Brunswick, and northern New Brunswickers do not probably sin as much as us in the south. <laughs> but in southern New Brunswick, we still preach and we still believe and we still experience the fact that sin in our lives is a problem. Because Satan will come to you, you know what, 
just sometimes on Saturday night, <laughs> sometimes on early Sunday morning. I'm glad Melody and I don't have any further to go to church than we do. Because when we lived three miles up the road, some of our wildest arguments would happen on the way to church. <laughs> Ever happened to you? Or you're just about time you get ready to do your devotions and pray, morning or evening, whenever you do it. And you have an old hair razor of an argument, or you, you look or think about something that it tempts you, and you think, oh, I can't go talk to you now, God. Listen, you've got to deal with it. I'm not going to hear and try to put sugar coating or cherries on the top, or yada, yada, yada. The only way to deal with sin is to confess it to God and repent of it. Say, God, I need your strength to help me not do this again. Amen? Amen. Can't do it on my own. Can't make it. You could make it. It's a big cross on your ceiling. If you could make it, that wouldn't have been needed. All kinds of religion teaching you nowadays, the cross wasn't necessary. The cr you can make this on your own. Self-help. If self-help worked, why did Jesus have to die? Number two, is there doubt in your minds and heart? I realize I I'm in northern New Brunswick. And northern New Brunswickers probably do not doubt as much as southern New Brunswickers. But in southern New Brunswickers, we still preach that having doubt in our hearts and minds is a problem. Maybe something happened. And this is the part of the service that's going to help somebody. I feel right now this is going to help somebody. And I know you've heard it before, but you got this weird guy with the beard up here this morning. He's going to tell you again. Here's the problem with doubt. You asked God for something very specific before, and it didn't happen the way you prayed it. And you're thinking, where'd he go? Is he still up there? Did he hear me? Did I have something wrong? What, what's going on? How many know God always answers prayer? It can be yes. Amen. David believed that he could take the giant. He did. But that same David prayed after he had been in sin with Bathsheba. Remember? That his child would live and it didn't. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is wait. That you have to wait on God and believe that God has a timeline laid out. Melody and I followed, on October 30th, 1998, God called us into full-time ministry. He said, sell your house, and when your house sells, that'll, that'll, the next step will happen. Very specific. I remember the spot I was on the altar and everything. Did that, you know, put it for sale sign. My parents had a bird because we were farming together in partnership with them. Can't you go to church without having to become the preacher? <laughs> Dad said to me, yep. Put the sign out, house didn't sell the first year. Wasn't a market like it is right now. House didn't sell the second year. House didn't sell the third year. The house didn't sell the fourth year. 2002, waiting on God, not knowing. We had plans. We had two or three ministers come and go during that time. It was a time when the church was going through that awful time of a pastor come, stay a year and a half, two years, and leave. Couldn't figure it out. God didn't want us in the middle of that turmoil. 2003, Jacques Hool, who I've wanted to talk about the whole morning, but I have a hard time when I do, showed up with some ministers from the Church of God. And a guy named Pastor Phil Sigelko moved to Mill Cove and our house sold that fall. Some of you have been waiting on God for a while, not necessarily to a call in ministry, but a, a prayer need that you had in your life. Keep waiting. Keep hoping. Keep believing. Keep faith, because God always answers prayer. Amen? We have to learn to accept his answers. Tell God you doubt. Ask him to forgive you for doubting. Say, Lord, increase my faith. Lastly, and I've been lastly three times now, we are going to eat eventually. I heard that there's beans that have been jacked up with sausages and meats and meatballs. I had a hard time coming out of that little back room. Pastor Glenn almost had to pull me by the ear. <laughs> but is there fear? You, you know, and our biggest fear in prayer is God's going to answer some way that we don't want him to answer. Oh, I'm scared to pray about this. It's when God does something. I know people that prayed for their spouse to come out of alcoholism, but now their spouse is out. And they're redeemed and they're going to church and they don't know how to live with them because they lived with the person that was a drunk for 25 years. Now what do I do? And you know something that's almost as hard as when you're in the middle of that other battle. Amen? Because you got this person now that you never thought this would ever happen, even though you prayed for it. 
I'm in northern New Brunswick. And I realize northern New Brunswickers probably don't fear as much as we do down there. But in southern Brunswick, we have to preach that having fear in our heart is a problem. If God has a plan, why are we afraid? If God has it all figured out, why do we doubt? Why do we, why do we go around? How many of Israel went around in the desert for 40 years? Because they had a problem. They had sin, and they had doubt, and they had fear. Amen? I don't want to run around them. I want God to take me to the promised land. I want my prayers answered. Come to him today. If you want to come this morning and pray again, I know we had prayer all through our time in, in worship, and it was exactly right there. It was exactly the right time. I felt that so strongly. But I want those of you that have a need this morning to come and pray with confidence. And I saved the juicy, server, the juicy, juicy scripture for last. And I see it's on the screen now. Now this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything, According to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have that petition. We have the petition that we asked of him. And ask him to answer in his way what's best for you, best for life, and best for the situation. How many want to do this this morning? You want to cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. I'll pray with you if you come. I'll believe with you when you come. Talk to God this morning. Just give it to Him. Pray with confidence this morning. You are stronger. You
thank the Lord for his coming and touching us and just speaking to us where, where we are today. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the message, Lord, of, you know, just, you're just asking us to focus on you, not the problem, but believing that you are hearing us and trusting that you are faithful and forever true. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this message. And I ask you, Lord, to go before us. Bless the food that we're about to consume together. Bless our fellowship and the connection, Lord, that you've given us, God. Let us not be careless, Lord, or even forget the blessing that you've given us this day. God, help your people recognize that you are here for them. Lord, just come. Just be who you are in the midst of us as we just finish off this service. Just bless the people online and here in person. In Jesus' name, I pray. I want to thank you for coming. Please stay and join us for the fellowship. If you have some things you want to talk to the pastor or me or Pastor Glenn, we're going to be here and we're going to stick around for you. Thank you for coming. May God bless you.